This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by the Virginia Education Association. An investment in teachers today will pay dividends tomorrow. Dignity Memorial. The Dignity Network provides professional and compassionate funeral, memorial, cremation, and cemetery services throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia. Virginia Hospital and Healthcare Association for jobs, the economy, and public health. Committed to advancing health and economic opportunity for all Virginians. Virginia Tourism Corporation, promoting why Virginia is for lovers, lovers of wine and craft beers, the outdoors, beaches, history, music, and more. Fall in love with Virginia at virginia.org. Additional support provided by these sponsors. and by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you. Welcome to This Week in Richmond. This conversation taking place today on February 8th, just a week after things started developing in crisis here at the Capitol. But the legislature has continued its work. Uh, you'll see from a graphic that we're going to put up on the screen that um, each chamber has gone through crossover. About half the bills have survived. Each chamber has passed a budget. And I'm delighted to have three experts talk not about all the crises that have happened, but to talk about legislation that's ongoing. Megan Ryan, and from the Virginia Coalition of Open Government, get that right, Andrew Smith, the Virginia Farm Bureau Federation, Bob Bradshaw from the Independent Insurance Agents of Virginia. Delighted to have each of you to talk with us some about some of the legislation, perhaps some that's still alive in the last uh, two weeks before the February 23rd scheduled adjournment. So who who would like to start? Bob, well, I'll, I'll you. See, yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, certainly right after crossover is when everybody starts focusing. Uh, as you mentioned, over 2,000 bills were introduced at the beginning of this session, about 1,000 are left. Uh, independent insurance agents, we monitor or work on a wide range of bills, about 100 bills. Uh, focused on our attention uh, early on, awful lot of health insurance bills, and you really wonder how they're going to fit together when so many have passed. A lot of uh, mandates have been uh, introduced, all sent to the Health Insurance Reform Commission, except for one or two, which we would argue will increase the price of health insurance. Um, you know, there's your bills that you are kind of glad didn't go any further. Uh, my favorite, of course, was the you could ride your motorcycle without a, without a helmet as long as you had uh, uh, an organ donation card. Uh, we thought that was amusing, but certainly introduced uh, uh, in all seriousness. Uh, and at this point, I would say that we have one bill that we're really focused on that sort of uh, introduced by the trial lawyers to try to uh, interject a bill that, frankly, we would say uh, there's really no need for, that you just run into a problem with an insurance company, 1-800-Bureau of Insurance, and talk to them and, and deal with them. So uh, you would hope that a lot of the bills that you're, you're really concerned about are dead at this point, but it allows you to focus, and certainly we found that uh, everybody is really more focused on the after crossover because it's either really good and it's going to fly through or it's really in contention and there's going to be some significant dialogues and, and we expect a lot of focus moving forward. Yeah, I agree. I mean, you, you hope always that things are more refined in, in the second half after crossover and, you know, but there's always something that hangs on that you, you continue oh, yeah. to work with and try to make uh, some type of resolution that it can, uh, you can work with or 
or figure it out to go forward. But, uh, you know, we're very fortunate. We represent the farmers of Virginia all across the state, and we have issues, uh, myself and our team, in just about every committee, I would say. And so there's always something going on, I mean, from local government, uh, production, agriculture, transportation. Certainly transportation had a big highlight this year with talk about uh, improvements on I-81 and whether there be tolls or gas tax. And that bill continues to go forward without any funding mechanism in it, but continue to look at it and how to improve because it is something we all use, especially in transportation of our product. So uh, I mean, we have a bill that we've been supporting on industrial hemp. You know, people <laughs> probably aren't talking about, but very important to rural economy, especially South Side Virginia, is hoping to be able to produce industrial hemp. You know, the farm bill that passed Congress last year separated uh, industrial hemp definition from traditional marijuana and related products uh, with the level of chemical in it that, uh, you know, law enforcement monitor. So we hope that we'll have a new product that can be grown in Virginia and processed here too. So, yeah, Megan, you have, you're from the unique organization. Uh, <laughs> I, I think these other two represent probably lots of different ones, but Coalition for Open Government, what are you all looking at? <laughs> Right. I, I was just thinking. So they, you know, they represent particular industries and constituencies. And Coalition for Open Government is about access to government records and meetings. And so we sort of represent all the citizens of Virginia. And um, and the legislation that we follow can be very um, arcane and um, inconvenient for a lot of government officials and I mean there's just not a lot of appetite for it um, just ever I mean it's it's a very esoteric type to uh, topic but one that we feel is very important so that uh, citizens can have the access to uh, information that they need to um, help understand what their government does or that helps um, them understand um, just helps them keep their government accountable so we followed like um, you know, like the others, about half of our bills are gone. Um, the remaining ones, a, a, a lot of them, and, and this is kind of what I mean about how it, it can be esoteric in, in the weeds, is that you can have a big bill maybe that has to do with uh, farming or insurance, uh, creating some in some other an, an authority or a commission, and then stuck in there in the very bottom <laughs> is a FOIA exemption. You know, <laughs> records related to industrial hemp applications are exempt from FOIA. Well, we don't like that, but you can't stop that train, yeah. you know, they're going because it's being pushed on substantive grounds, and that's where the real arguments are 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 taking place. And so when we stand up and we say, well, we don't like this FOIA por portion, they're like. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we can't mess with that right now. But I think we both, all three, have been on one side or the other of that train. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Yeah. yeah. Oh, sure, yeah. sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah. How did that get in there? Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I, I had wondered, and, and if you don't mind my asking you about it, that one of the high profile, I think, bills on FOIA has been records for past governors being yeah. available until, while in a more timely fashion, and it seems like there may even be money in the budget proposed by the one of one or both of the chambers and trying to trying to make get more staff over at the Library of Virginia to be able to get those records available. Right, right. So, um, and I and I think if you've when we've gone to all these meetings, the state librarian does testify um, to the fact that they would love to be able to turn around these these records, but um, their staff over the years has been reduced from 200 to I think 125, and so they just don't have the the manpower as well as the volume is increased because since now we use email for everything, and, you know, it used to just be boxes of paper records. Now you're getting terabytes and of data, and uh, that's just a whole lot to try to go through. Well, we've got a 30-page bill on insurance agent licensing. You don't want to talk about that. I'm just, I'm just shocked. I don't think there's a FOIA ex exception in, in that bill, but I mean, it's, it's dumbfounding. It's really good reading. Yeah. What about some, any other bills that, that not, don't, they don't fall specifically in the areas that, you, that you've been working on, but have kind of been interesting, surprising, or... And, and out there, maybe they died, maybe they're still alive. Well, I mentioned the uh, motorcycle helmet bill, certainly a safety bill. Um, I, I agree, generally speaking, there are bills that you say, wow, I didn't know that. You, I mean, it's quite an education to come down because there's a wide range of issues that are being discussed. 
Uh, and frankly, one way of a lot of them just fly over my head. It's, it's very complicated issues, especially in the Commerce and Labor Committee and electric re-regulation, deregulation. So I don't particularly get too much of those, but um, we're just real happy that the Trusted Choice Insurance, Independent Insurance Agents Week bill is flying through. <laughs> and that first of March, right before flood season, that's gonna be a good bill. Right, I can't put my finger on one either, David, but I mean, it's always an education when you're waiting for your bills or monitoring other bills and some things that pop up. That's like, wow, is that a thing? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. I never knew that was a problem. <laughs> um, we have an intern um, that we, a, a college student who f follows us around during the session, and I always have them go into, the college students, and I have them go into the ABC subcommittees <laughs> because they understand alcohol. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then that, I mean, and that's just so. I, you just never knew that they had to regulate all that kind of stuff. Like this year, there have been these bills about defining what a confectionery is. And it's basically so that people can make liquor-filled cupcakes, you know, things like that, or candy with, with liquor in them. And you didn't know that you needed a law to allow you to do that. Or I mm -hmm. certainly didn't until I started going to these subcommittees. Yeah. And yeah. it's a real education, not just for you know, the students, but definitely for me as well. You know, it's interesting, and, and you're already seeing it in some of the committees, that a bill that flew out of one chamber lands in the other, and, and the other chamber looks at it a little, little differently. And I think already I've heard at least one or two uh, chairs of committees saying, now just because your bill passed unanimously <laughs> doesn't mean that we're not going to take a look at it. And, and gosh, some of those bills sometimes get side railed, I mean, get killed, even though one chamber loved them. It's sometimes that's a good thing. <laughs> I was going to say sometimes they're our bills. <laughs> yeah, yes. Well, some of that too, I think, is that it's kind of a myth of unanimity, I think. You, when you have them coming out of subcommittee, um, maybe on a 7-0 vote, then the, su the full committee often doesn't really take the time to go through it, and they just take the recommendation of the subcommittee. And then then they get put into the block that um, you know, says un uncontested from the committee when there might be some actual, uh, some contention around that bill, but uh, it does, it's not necessarily reflected in the 99-0 right. vote. It's also an election year. Uh, <laughs> so there are different rules going on and different things going on behind the scenes that we would think this is not a D or an R issue and then wow, what happened to that? It's <clears throat> really kind of interesting. Yes, yes. Well, listen, I want to thank each of you for being on. Our time has flown by. We're going to be hearing from three staffers to three of the senators talking <laughs> about some of the same kind of process and issues that you're all talking about. But, but Megan, Andrew, and Bob, thank you each for being on This Week in Richmond. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Delighted to have three legislative staffers from three senators, and you're well known here around Capitol Square and also back in the districts, your work. Appreciate your being on and talking with us about some legislation. Cindy Hosmer, Senator Frank Ruff, Patty Dempsey, Senator Steve Newman, and Abby Phillips, Senator Jennifer McClellan. And we don't have a great deal of time, so one of you just jump right in and start talking about one of the bills that, of the thousand, perhaps, that are still alive here after crossover. Abby, yeah. we'll pick you, go ahead, start. So one bill that, I, that um, is, is fairly significant um, that we've been working on is expanding mental health curriculum from um, grades K through 12. Last year, Senator Deeds um, was redoing curriculum in ninth and 10th grade for mental health okay. students. Um, or for students, um, and this year we were looking at expanding that because we're seeing numbers coming out with the CDC where mental health diagnoses are increasing, even from kids as young as two years of age, and we're seeing numbers in the millions, like 4.4 million kids are being diagnosed with ADHD, depression and anxiety is up, suicide rates are up, and we have compounding difficulties because 
there was a, um, a financial cap put on what the state um, provides in terms of funding for support personnel, so like school counselors, um, social workers, um, those support staff that often would be there to help the students maybe navigate some of these mental health challenges, there's been a cap put on that. So they don't have as many support staff helping. So we're trying to look at the issue through the curriculum so that students are getting trained on um, what mental health looks like um, and, and red flags even when they can see it in their peers so that even starting at kindergarten, age appropriate of course, we're starting to infiltrate this training really early on to help try to combat some of the mental health concerns we have with our youth. Very good. Patty? Uh, following up on school uh, issues, we have a bill um, that was related to school safety, which is obviously very important this day and time. Uh, it resulted uh, from the select uh, committee uh, that was developed last year from the tragedy of the school shooting down in Florida. And there were, um, it was the first of its kind in over 150 years where people got together to study and say, what can we do to help make our students safer? And one of the bills that came out of that was a bill that Senator Newman has carried, and it's passed unanimously uh, in both the House and the Senate. And it is designed um, where um, the requirement is that every school, local school board will have a, um, uh, they'll be required to provide training for their staff, their teachers, and the students so they know what to do uh, in an emergency situation or a crisis situation. You know, like we have tornado drills, fire drills, and things like that. This is just another way that the students get used to knowing what to do if there were a true emergency. And uh, it just has plans in place, and that has to be done at least once a year. Um, and the setup is the requirement there. We hope that will help provide a little bit of uh, assurance and comfort you know, to parents and teachers and the students as well. Okay, thanks. Well, as you know, workforce development is near and dear to the Senator's heart and, and it will improve. The Amazon headquarters coming to NOVA is a big coup for all of us. It's going to help the community. Um, it's looking at 25,000 jobs by, I think, 2039. Don't, don't quote me on that one. But it will bring the average salary is going to be $150,000. That gives us an amazing tax base with the Virginia income tax, which is going to help the communities all around the state of Virginia. There'll be a trickle-down effect of other companies that come in to help support this. There'll be better education opportunities to University of Virginia, Virginia Tech are going to be coming to the area to teach specifically to the skills that high-tech companies need, which is something that we don't really have much of because much of us is rural. Um, I just, I, I watched this man has worked so hard since I have worked for him. He has thought outside the box. We had always done two-year college degrees, four-year college degrees. Companies coming in needed people that could use the equipment that they had that required certification or licensure. He approached higher education people and community colleges and got to work with them and got state funding to help them start programs that did certificates and licensures. So when these people graduate, not in two years, not in four years, but sometimes weeks and months, they were able to be hired immediately with decent paying jobs, which is something new for our rural areas, have not been able to do that. So I'm just very, very proud of the hard work that he's put into improving the lives of everyone, but especially Southside Virginia. In a, in a couple of weeks, it'll be February 23rd, and then you're back in, the, in your district offices, mm -hmm. and uh, tell us something about what you'll be doing back in the district office, whether it's Southside and Lynchburg area, or right here at the Capitol, where, where Senator McClellan has, has her district office. What, what are some of the main things, Cindy, that you, that you do when you're back in that district office? Well, constituent services is a big thing. It's something that kind of gets set aside a little too much here because we're so busy with legislation. Um, a lot of state agencies out there, people don't know how to access, don't know what services may be available to them. We're able to connect them with them. We're able to bring their issues to the right people in the state agencies. Our state agencies are wonderful. They're overwhelmed, but they're wonderful to work with people. Um, getting around to the localities, the different meetings, the chamber meetings, the economic development business meetings, town councils. Uh, Senator Russ spends a lot of time going there to listen and hear the concerns of the people. And that's how he learns what we need and how to help them. Um, correspondence, I mean, there's, it, it changes every single day. It's, it's an amazing experience. Yeah, 
We'll be working actually tomorrow back in the district <laughs> when we go home this weekend. We're doing a mid-session update uh, for uh, constituents, so they will be uh, invited to come out and uh, have a, a free breakfast and just listen to what's been going on in uh, um, in session. And uh, then after session, we have, as Cindy mentioned, all of the uh, local uh, chambers and different groups have us, you know, have Senator Newman come in and listen to all the things that resulted from the session. And then uh, the constituent services is huge. Uh, that continues on in the agency work and. Uh, um, there's just a lot of, you know, the office work and taking care of the interns. I oversee, you know, the interns that we have in the office and keeping up with uh, preparing them and helping them uh, uh, to have a good experience working in our office. And uh, it's just a lot of opportunities to work with a lot of people in our community. We meet some wonderful people. That's one of the favorite things I think about my job is just the people. And I think one of the most rewarding things for me is just when a constituent gets an issue resolved and, you know, they've been yes. having trouble just getting to that right person in the state government to help them uh, take care of an issue that they're having. And they're just so relieved and I'm just so pleased that we can help them, you know, maybe cut these some red tape or just get to that right person that's going to take care of and address their situation. And that's very meaningful to me. And Abby, you are among several uh, staffers whose senator or delegate has an office right here in the Pocahontas building, right, right here in Richmond. So, That's right. But still it's a transition time for you in the session. Yeah, yeah. Echoing what some of the ladies have said today, we um, some things do get put on hold during session in terms of the outreach that we like to regularly be doing. Um, but we're always looking for ways to connect with our constituency in our district. Um, and, and one of the things I think is really important is disseminating the information about what laws are going to go into place in July um, to our constituents because there's a lot that comes through and it can be very helpful to break it down and be able to explain to those living in our districts. So I think town halls is a really important aspect of that. But then also just getting getting the word back out to the district that we're here and we're available if they if they need anything and um, we want to make sure that they understand what services we can offer so that they can reach out to us when the time comes or if the time comes. You know, administrative assistants who work during the session are are here and then they're gone. But the legislative staffers are very much year around. Mm -hmm. Probably someone watching this show is saying, that sounds like a very interesting job. It is. And, and obviously the three of you enjoy what you do, enjoy working with the legislators. What, uh, you probably have different backgrounds that got you into that, and I think it'd be interesting for the, the, the viewers to know what got you started, what was your background, and is there, other than just being good with people, what are there any particular skill sets that you would need to be a legislative staffer? I think attention to detail, being able to do research on projects, to, to not quit when it seems a little bit difficult, but to keep searching and searching until you get the answer that you need. Um, people skills, obviously. Compassionate heart, but not being a bleeding heart, which my boss struggles with me sometimes. But um, it, I have developed so many skills that I never even knew I could do with this job. And I have an incredibly patient senator with me. But yeah, and attention to details is really a big thing and follow up. Being self-motivation is a really important thing. My background, kind of career one for me, was a school teacher, being a school teacher. And uh, I found that really prepared me well. Uh, working with parents and you know working with uh, principals and working with uh, just different uh, a lot of different people in that way and um, and it was interesting I have found as I've taught the people throughout you know my time and career with the uh, Senate of Virginia a lot of people come from an education background I think uh, into this job and uh, uh, it, there's some overlaps there you know just the interest in people and, and caring and wanting to teach and uh, and reach you know people. Um, and I think that, that that helps me a lot. And I've enjoyed just you know, wearing those different hats, it's like what hat am I wearing at this moment? Because, you know, being a, basically a one person staff back in the district, uh, you know, I'm the office manager, you know, I go get our supplies, I go get, you know, I, I, I oversee, like I said, interns or other people who work with us, uh, volunteers, and uh, 
Uh, I do bookkeeping for us and just all sorts of different hats that, that you need to know and be able to, know, to do when you're there. Abby, in our last 30 seconds, did you Yeah, uh, I come from a social work background, so um, I did uh, what we call macro social work when I was studying, so it's looking at policy, it's looking at systemic issues, it's looking at kind of the bigger picture, like what do we need to change on a systemic issue to help um, resolve issues in our community, and working in a legislative office is kind of a per perfect place to implement that. Um, so that's my background, and it's served me very well in this position, especially in terms of also that human relation component with connecting with people. I want to thank each of you for being on this work in Richmond and, and very much for all your comments and for what you do for your senators. Thank you. Thank you. This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by the Virginia Education Association. An investment in teachers today will pay dividends tomorrow. Dignity Memorial. The Dignity Network provides professional and compassionate funeral, memorial, cremation, and cemetery services throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia. Virginia Hospital and Health Care Association for jobs, the economy, and public health. Virginia Tourism Corporation, promoting why Virginia is for lovers, lovers of wine and craft beers, the outdoors, beaches, history, music, and more. Fall in love with Virginia at virginia.org. Additional support provided by these sponsors. and by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you.